All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Humanizing Your Brand webinar series presented by Online Optimism. I'm your host, Sam Olmsted, and throughout this series, you'll learn how to connect with your audience, build trust with your customers, and grow your organization by creating a more human brand with a more personal touch. Um, just like in the past few weeks, each week we are featuring two industry leading experts who have proven track records uh, and insider tips that will help you reshape your brand's focus and your core messaging. Before we get started, let's discuss the format of the webinar. Each speaker will present for about 20 minutes uh, and then we'll have a 20 minute Q&A after both presentations are complete. So please feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A chat at the bottom of your screen. Um, if there are questions about the format or the process, uh, then we can answer those during the webinar. But if the questions are about the presentations themselves, then we'll just wait and then ask those aloud afterwards. So um, I'd like to have kind of a, a open discussion at the end of these presentations. So feel free to ask your questions and we will get to all of them, I promise. As your host, I've muted all of the attendees throughout this webinar uh, to cut down on any background noise but please feel free to add your thoughts in the chat uh, as we go. Last thing is uh, we'll be recording this webinar. So we will post it online on our channels after this and I will let you know all about that. So let's get started. This is our third week of the Humanizing Your Brand webinar series and I'm pleased to introduce our speakers today. Our first speaker is Jaleesa McDowell. Jaleesa McDowell is the founder and owner of McDowell's Branding Group. McDowell's Branding Group offers public relations, branding, and event planning. They have years of experience in executing major live events, activations, project development, marketing, promotions, and public relations. The company's niche is entertainment public, public relations <laughs> with clients in fashion, beauty, music, and film. Take it away, Jaleesa. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sam. And thank you guys and your entire team for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Okay. Well, let's definitely dive right into it. So the human side of PR and event activation. Let's get into it, you guys. So this is just, you know, who I am. I have experience in clients um, in working with the Essence Festival, Atlantic Records, Fuse TV, um, and with the Essence Festival, I worked with them for about 10 years. <laughs> Started out as a volunteer, um, and now I help them build out their sponsorship activation, um, and I work directly with their team. Um, with Atlantic Records, I actually, again, started out very early. Um, I handled all of the Louisiana region. Um, when artists came into town, I would have to prep for interviews, um, events, and just made sure that the market was saturated with whoever that artist was, whether it was a Trey Songs, <laughs> um, I had Diggy Simmons, um, all of that. And then with Fuse TV, we'll get into later. Um, and then most importantly for me, life is definitely about service. Um, and that's really how I started my career was working behind the scenes um, and making sure that I was able to shine a light on people where there was their passion, no matter what it was. So that is the core of who I am. So today we're gonna talk about PR. Um, we are going to talk about creating and controlling your business, um, your narrative. Then we'll talk about maintaining positive brand reputation, building relationships between businesses and communities and generating that organic attention. So let's just go into like a quick definition of PR. So I wanted to look this up for myself um, and so many people explain it in different ways. So public relations is the professional maintenance of a favorable public image by a company organization or person. And then another one is the state of the relationship between the public and a company. And then how I like to explain it to clients is literally, I, I break it down, is public perception. 
So whatever you want the public to know about your brand, then that's what you push to the forefront. If it's something that you say, hey, we don't want to put that in the media, then dial it back and don't talk about it. But whatever that key message is, then we want to push that to the forefront. And we want to make sure that we are not only making sure that they know about your brand, but we want to also make sure that your brand is favorable to the media as well. So how do you create that brand narrative? So with a lot of clients, I tell them, you know, dive deep into not only your personal story, but find those key things about your brand that's going to not only set you apart, but also identify your story. So how did you start? What are some obstacles that you had to overcome? Find those key things. And then brand representation. R brand um, representation for, for, for a lot of my clients is definitely all about um, making sure they're really, their reputation is, is first of all, you have to start off in a high note. <laughs> you don't wanna um, leave a bad taste in people's mouth early on. So you wanna make sure that your reputation is, is staying on the highest level. So that can go with customer service. That can go with how you're communicating um, if you have a team of people, um, you just want to make sure that everything is staying on the highest level um, as much as possible. And then the core thing also is about building relationships between businesses and communities. So start with your tribe. I always tell clients, who are going to be those key people that are going to support you from the beginning? And then you want to continue to those tribe members to continue to then attract more people and allow them to spread the word. So keeping that within your tribe and building it out is super important. And then that goes into generating that organic attention. So again, those tribe members, they're going to post about your book. They're going to post about your service. They're going to post about the amazing things that you have coming up. So you wanna make sure that you're able to keep that organic as possible in the beginning. Creating a strong brand narrative, rooted in reality, keep it simple, craft a long-term story, add flair and creativity that enhances the experience and make an genuine empathetic connection with the target audience. So creating that strong brand narrative. Again, you wanna make sure that you stay authentic. I think this day and age, everyone wants to connect with people that are authentic. They don't want it to be super <laughs> fabulous and, and lavish. They wanna be able to connect with you and they wanna be able to know, okay, well, this is someone that I can trust, not only if it's um, you offering up a service or if you're offering up a product. They wanna know, can I trust you? You know, what is your experience? So understanding that is definitely key. Finding your personal story. Be authentic to your brand. We just went over that. So making sure that you find those key moments and those key points in your story so that you can push that within your overall brand. So even with myself, whether I was working years ago interning for the Essence Festival, you know, I use that story to build out my brand. And a lot of times me using my key story is something that brings me clients. So they'll see the, the trials and the struggles of me interning early on, me not really knowing, you know, what I was going to do. So think about those key moments in your life. What, are, what does that story look like? And how can you authentically tell that at every, every moment? So whether that's social, whether you're speaking on a panel, whether that's through a campaign, how can you tell your story in an effective way where people are going to connect with you they see you as authentic and they see you as someone that they would trust with their business. And 
they see you as someone that they would want to, of course, you know, spend money with you and then also follow your brand as well. Find what sets you apart from other businesses in your industry and in your location as well. So finding what's going to set you apart. So if you have a business in New Orleans, that's where I am right now. <laughs> so you want to find those things that are going to set you apart. If you have a business in Atlanta, you know, where I, I currently live. So those, it's going to be different. You know, so me living in New Orleans at one point was totally different. So I had to set myself apart. Uh, when I first moved here, I knew, okay, what are some things you have to identify those things where you see gaps? So if you see something within your industry and you see those gaps, you may see a business owner and they may have a great business, but people may not know their story. And so that was the key thing for me when I first moved here to New Orleans was, okay, I see people with amazing businesses, but do people really know their story? How can I better connect them with the media? How can I better connect them with their audience? How can I better help them tell their story in that way where people would not only, okay, oh my gosh, I love, I love his story or I love her story. Let me see if I want to go purchase food from this restaurant. Let me join in supporting this person on a regular basis. Like those are the key things that will automatically drive people in and really help you help you gain a long time follower. And then being consistent and committed to your story. So all the, it goes back to how are you gonna tell it? So if it's through social media and people know you for, oh my gosh, I remember, hey, they posted about um, the fryer not working, whatever it is, stay consistent with it. Take people not only on that journey, but stay consistent. So whether you're telling your story, again, speaking on a panel, whether you're telling your story through the media, no matter what it is, or even if you are telling your story with someone that <laughs> spots you, which has happened to clients, they spot you um, in Walmart, you want to stay consistent with what people are identifying your public image as. So that is definitely important. And then to the media. So in PR, the media, we are best friends. That is our go-to person. That is our right-hand man. That is who is really attached to us to be able to make all the amazing magic happen with clients. So identify your target audience. So who are you trying to attract with your brand? Those are the key things. So I may have a client that is a women's empowerment speaker. Then we know, okay, well, we have to go for women. What's the age range? If it's 35 and up, okay, we have the age range. Where are they? What are they watching? Are they watching the Tamron Hall show? Are they watching The View? <laughs> they may be watching, you know, they may be staying up to date with The Shade Room. You know, they may be staying up to date with gossip blogs. So what does that look like for your audience? So early on, you have to define that. So you have to understand what does that look like? And you also have to understand and make sure that you stay on top of the trends. So if it's a new show that's coming out, um, like what are they watching on TV? So with own network, if they're watching, hey, the have and have not, then let's, let's tune in. Let's see what, what are those moments where what makes them want to watch this show? No matter what it is, um, just stay on top of that. And then with building your media context. So there are definitely multiple ways in doing that. And as a publicist, and especially starting out as a solo entrepreneur, um, especially, you know, I had to do a lot of research. And so there's so much available to us now with um, social media, with LinkedIn, um, even Twitter. So if you identify someone and you say, oh my gosh, they may do something as CNN business, um, their angle may be business. Look up those different media um, personalities on social media. 
a lot of times their context is right there. So start to build that out. So once you figure out, okay, your audience loves to watch CNN or your audience loves to read Ebony, Jet, or Essence, um, whatever it is, then you wanna make sure that you're staying up to date with those um, platforms and those brands and those media outlets and building your contacts slowly. And now, this is probably the most important part when it comes to PR, building and creating that perfect pitch. So one thing that you definitely wanna do when you finally identify who that media um, contact is, then you wanna start a, a, a really build that solid foundation as far as a relationship. So with a lot of media, um, especially professionals, you know, they, they have people coming at them all the time. So figure out a way that you can help them. So if it's, hey, you know, and I do this often. So if it's, hey, you know, I notice a new business open up or I noticed that you're doing um, a lot of a lot of media, especially, well, even in print, um, but especially in news, you have some news reporters that have new ser a new series. So they may be looking for whether, you know, I know Sheba Sark, she has a, a new ARPA series. Um, I saw another young lady in Texas. She has a, a series all about natural hair. She has a series all about you know, just um, embracing who you are. So it's those type of things. So if I was to say, hey, um, Laura, I see that you have a new series on natural hair. Oh my gosh, I have this amazing person that I just saw. She's had, she has a great following online. Can I connect you guys? I think she would be perfect for your story. So it's those little things in reaching out to make sure that they understand like, oh, well, you definitely care about <laughs> what I do and you're helping me instead of asking me for something first. So building that relationship and having a, a solid foundation is definitely key. Sell each reporter individually. They have a unique story of their own. Make their job easy by producing a thorough and well-written pitch. So let's go into the pitch. So um, I'm trying to see a client recently. Let's see. I can talk about, um, I work with an Arthur here in New Orleans, a young guy. So my pitch for him was based off of, of course, him being young. <laughs> First of all, writing a full children's book. So that was definitely an angle that I could position in that way. And then him also really tapping into the minds of young people, wanting to, to dream more. And then he also did a campaign where he was giving away a hundred free books. So all of those things are gonna help me with my pitch and help me with the different angles. And one thing about angles, so it may be different with every media outlet. So my pitch for that young man in his book and him as an author, it may not work um, in one way with just news. Um, we had a feature in Black Enterprise and they were spotlighting young men doing amazing things in their community. So I can use that community aspect of his brand and talk about what he's doing in the community. And then in another angle is specifically just about the book. Okay, what is gonna make people wanna read this book? What is gonna make people want to dive deeper into the theme of this book? So if it's about dreamers, if it's about young kids, then we wanna make sure that we have those different angles. So that they would definitely want to book that client to be on their news broadcast, write about him in print magazines, have them on their podcasts, um, their TV shows, um, whatever it is, their digital magazines, whatever type of media it is, we want to make sure that we're positioning him in that way that he can win. And then another great tip is to keep 
stay stay updated on what those media outlets are working on. So if you know that, hey, they have a new series going on, or if you, or if you see that, oh, well, it looks like right now they're currently working on, I don't know, uh, men from New Orleans, or they're currently trying to spotlight men um, that are doing amazing things in Atlanta. Just staying on top of that will sometimes allow you that easy access to making sure that you have that um, media placement and that you get that interview, which is, that's the end game. So maximize the PR for your brand. So using social media is definitely a great aspect of maximizing that PR. So once you finally land that amazing news interview, once you finally see you've got that story in that magazine that you love. Once you get that experience with being on a blog or a podcast that you admire, we can't just let it sit there. <laughs> so you have to make sure that you repost it to your social media. Um, I've done this a lot with clients. Use the newest and the latest uh, with media platforms. So if you want to do a TikTok, get creative. You know, reshare that. Oh my gosh, I was on the news. Oh my gosh, you know, I I was on on the Tamron Hall show. Whatever it is, you want to make sure that you are recapping those things so that people can people that, that didn't tune into the news would absolutely say, oh, wow, this is what you have going on. Or, oh my gosh, you know, I want to follow you right now and stay in tune with what's next for you because that interview was awesome. Or that interview made me feel some type of way and I'm motivated to do more within my own life. So you want to make sure that you don't just leave that news clip on the news or on their website, share it. And more people willingly they will honestly share it as well. And they will share it to their stories. They will share it on Facebook, Twitter, whatever that is, they will share it. And then another thing um, that I've found super helpful for clients is allowing them to go on that journey with you. So if you know, okay, we are opening up a restaurant, we're, we're we're launching, you know, I've worked with a client, she's, she launched a new seasoning line. Allow your followers and your supporters to go on that journey with you. So if you're going to buy bottles for the seasoning, <laughs> allow them, capture that, capture that. So you have to make sure while you have that amazing press hit with CNN or you were on the Tamron Hall show or you were on this amazing blog that you love, still take that time to go back to, to where it all began and make sure that you're allowing your followers to go in on it, to come in on it. So not only do we have this amazing interview we did, oh my gosh, you guys, you know what? I'm working on a new product. So let's go behind the scenes and let's see how I'm gonna ultimately get this out into the marketplace. So that's super important. And again, we touched on just sharing the recaps and the press placements. Um, and then also, you know, a, a lot, especially for me, I share those wins on my website as well. So when you have that big placement, share it on your website. So when people go to your site, then they're more likely to say, okay, well, you have the experience, you have, you know, your past wins and your past event, event experience, your past PR experience, then I ultimately, I can trust you with my brand. Okay, so I wanted to kind of get into um, a most recent um, client success for me when it comes to PR. So <laughs> we are getting down to business for, with, for the business for it. And they are a new restaurant in New Orleans, um, two friends, um, and it's so crazy. I only knew one of them when I lived here. And then um, the other owner, we actually connected um, through, we were gonna start some work with her book 
and we never got a chance to start it. And then we reconnected when they decided to open up a business in the midst of the pandemic. <laughs> so when things were looking unsure, they decided to open it up. And I only had probably less than a month to create this buzz for their business and to get them some media placements. So one of the first things I did was again, what does that brand narrative look like? So what is the story behind this? So who are these two women? So those are the things that I had to first look at. Okay, how can we identify this? They're two friends, um, they're black women. It's a black owned business. Um, of course, right now, that's definitely something that's hot um, within the media is giving um, more visibility and more opportunities to black business owners. So I took that into account as well. But most importantly, I wanted to dive deeper into their story. So their whole thing was, hey, we wanna open this business. What they told me was we wanted to open this business because we wanted people to have faith that they can do anything, no matter the uncertain times, no matter what that was. So I took that key quote, <laughs> that key direct quote from that, from my clients, and I utilized that and I positioned it and angled it in a way where the media would understand, oh my gosh, well, they have the faith to do it. Then, you know, we should talk about it. They have an amazing location. We should talk about it. They're doing something innovative within the restaurant industry. We should talk about it. So it's all of those key points that are gonna make you favorable to the media. They're gonna wanna know and then also just deciding again, what that brand narrative is and sticking with it. So now that people may have saw their um, news clips online, whatever it is, they're following them now. They wanna know like, what is the rest of this journey gonna look like? Is it gonna be more <laughs> locations? What is that gonna look like? Um, and then and then I already touched on that point, just giving a post-pandemic safe space, sense of hope. That was the key strategy um, with pitching the business bar. And that's just a great photo of their food, their cocktails, all of that. And then you guys, we're just gonna look at a quick, just news clip. Tonight, two women are getting ready to witness their dreams become reality. Jessica Robinson and Jade Newman, from right here in New Orleans, are opening a unique restaurant space in the middle of the pandemic. WDSU anchor Christina Watkins tells us why they decided to open up the business bar right now. So it feels really good to be um, a black woman-owned business and to be able to inspire other people, because that's what it's all about. Taking a leap of faith in the middle of a pandemic. We're so excited to welcome family, friends. That's what Jade Newman and Jessica Robinson are doing in New Orleans by opening the business bar. The restaurant bar and workstation. So within the business bar, there are stations where people can set up their lap laptop. You'll also be able to like print things out if you need to. The New Orleanians work in hospitality, and they know first hand the devastating impacts the pandemic had for many within their industry. But they didn't want those hardships to get in the way of their goals. I feel like we survived 2020. Um, and I, I, there's, there's nothing else I think, you know, can really happen, you know, to bring us down if we survive those, you know, 12 months. And so you combine their hospitality skills on top of their own hard earned dollars. And then you get this restaurant on Ferret Street. The two said they're grateful with this location because it actually allows them to adapt to whatever COVID-19 restrictions may be in place. We actually have a patio area, so that was another plus mm -hmm. um, to the location, right? Um, we've also talked with, and I think it's called Parklet um, with the city of New Orleans. Um, so we're in the process of that, so where we'll be able to add extra seating um, in the parking spaces in front. Thank you all for coming. Both Newman and Robinson said they are looking forward to this new business venture and they want everyone to know this is just 
the beginning. This is my dream. You know, this is my <laughs> ultimate dream. In New Orleans, Christina Watkins, WDSU News. The business bar officially opens tomorrow. Okay. And so that was the business bar. And one of the key things um, with the business bar, what we did great was share that news clip again, share it online. We were able to share that and it received so much great feedback. It, it, it really allowed them to capture a new audience, allow them to capture people that were willing to come on the journey with them. And ultimately it brought them more business. It brought them amazing press and about, it also brought them amazing um, awareness within the media space. So let's dive a little bit into event activation. So with events, um, with event activation in particular, it's all about an engaging, amazing event. Um, how is your audience going to be wild? Um, and then also making sure that you separate your business from the rest. And how can you add social media into that as well? Um, a lot of times we find it to be difficult sometimes. <laughs> we all have so much going on and so much coming at us. So I think an amazing way to keep, your, keep the attention of your audience is to ultimately do an amazing event. And of course, you know, we're in COVID times, but when things open back up and or if you're able to do it in a safe way, event activation is amazing. So why do consumers love your brand? How can your brand deliver a unique experience? Um, so identifying what are those ways where people can really connect with your brand and figuring out what that's gonna look like in an event setting. Um, tell a story about your brand through event activation and the experience should offer, ultimately lead back to, to your brand. So when they connect with your brand, you wanna make sure that you have amazing takeaways. So um, on the side here, you'll see uh, one of my clients, you know, she thought on her feet quickly um, at the top of the pandemic uh, with these um, amazing, amazing face coverings and masks. So those are the type of things where, you know, it's needed. So if you were to do an event, hey, perfect time to brand uh, an amazing face mask um, right now. Then for an event activation, it's also about location, location. So you wanna make sure that you have a place where I know down here, and especially in bigger cities, it's all about um, amazing parking, um, making sure that it's not too tight of a space. Um, and then also, you want to make sure that you pick those venues that have a great reputation as well. Um, and then also with your venue, figure out if you can bring in food or drinks or if that's something you, you may want to bring in a chef. Um, you have to figure out all of these things. So make sure that it's a great technology setup um, that you could also, is, is again, great parking and that is going to wow people. So whether it's the, the decor, whether it's the structures, whatever it is, you want to make sure it wows people. So after you figure out what is going to be those engaging things within your, um, your event activation, you want to make sure that you also have a plan in place to collect emails, <laughs> collect phone numbers, Whatever it is, you want to make sure because you want to stay really close in contact with your, um, your attendees. You want to let them know, hey, we appreciate you for coming. Um, we want to send you a quick recap. We want to send you the link to the, um, the photo booth that was there. Um, and this is just an example. Um, I have, I use MailChimp, you know, so something simple where you can collect those emails and send out your own branded um, email marketing and your own, um, have your own email list. So you can keep people up to date with what's coming next. Um, so this was a recent one that I did on uh, my country music artist, Danny Wright. 
just letting it keeping my audience and my followers and people that love um, to connect with my brand, keeping them updated with what my new clients are doing. So we're gonna hop in to we wanna hop in quickly about um, Big Frida um, and the event that I did with her here. So again, I'm just gonna show this quickly to you guys. This is another video. Um, so one of the key things that we did with Big Frida was making sure um, when Frida had her own uh, reality show, we wanted to make sure that people understood the essence of New Orleans, that they understood it was all about having a good time. So of course we did a second line entrance. Of course it was amazing food. It was all of those things. So I'll let you guys take a look at this quickly. I stepped out on a limb and I took a chance with myself and with my career. My friend, Worthy Laser, me and him, we started to travel all around the world. Things just started moving in all type of directions for me and I was so blessed around so many wonderful people. I come from a church background and prayers help with everything. You know, I run my ass off, I stay focused and I try to let all the good be in the backdrop. I definitely want to do something with this Candy LaBelle. If I had a chance, I would do something with Lil Richard. You know, I want to do something with Drake, Lil Wayne. Any artist who's not afraid to collaborate with the Queen. Give me one second. Hey, Jalisa, are you uh, still presenting? Yeah, I lost my screen, guys. I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. No, that that was the tail end of it. Um, the most important thing with Big Frida, we wanted to make sure that we incorporated her. She had a, an amazing wine that was out. And so we wanted to make sure we incorporated that. She actually catered for the event. So we wanted to spotlight um, her amazing cooking um, skills. Uh, we had branded fans. So when we had the second line, we wanted to make sure we spotlighted that. So those are the most important things when you want to engage with your audience and making sure that they have those key takeaways, making sure that they have an amazing and fun time with your event. So again, I appreciate you guys so much for the opportunity to present. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to sticking around. All right, thank you so much, Jaleesa. I really appreciate your presentation. Found it really interesting, specifically about pitching journalists and kind of meeting them where they are and offering them something rather than kind of asking for something. So um, <clears throat> we'll definitely talk more about different parts of your presentations, uh, presentation in the Q&A. So we'll get to that in just a little bit. So as a reminder, everyone, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A chat and we will ask them aloud after um, Morgan's presentation. All right, so uh, thank you again, Jaleesa. We're gonna move on to our next speaker, Morgan Bashman, who is going to discuss how to build ads to attract an audience at your next event. Um, before she starts, let's get to know Morgan a bit more. <clears throat> As the Director of Digital Advertising at Online Optimism, Morgan oversees all aspects of online search engine marketing campaigns for a variety of businesses. Morgan has led Online Optimism in becoming a Google partner agency, a designation that illustrates the excellence and size of the campaigns created and the extensive education required or acquired when advertising with Google. 
Morgan grew up in New Orleans and has been with Online Optimism for seven years and loves helping businesses grow. So take it away, Morgan. Thank you so much, Sam. And thank you to Jalisa as well. Uh, what an amazing presentation. Um, yeah, you're, uh, Jalisa is obviously amazing at sort of creating these narratives and, and organizing these events. Whereas my specialty is more getting the word out about said creativity and events. Um, so let me just start sharing my screen really quickly. All right. And I will present here. Alrighty then guys. So welcome to uh, my presentation. It, it's called, if you build the right ad, they will come. Um, and yeah, um, just a little bit more about me, uh, Morgan Bashman. I've been in the marketing industry for over seven years now. On any given day, I'm probably managing uh, some sort of advertising on seven different platforms. Uh, it's really great for keeping me sharp, learning a lot of different new features and functionality, um, and uh, just learning about different audiences as well. Um, I was also an English major in college, and I think that directly serves me um, in my marketing career uh, daily. Uh, so if there are any other liberal arts majors out there, uh, please feel free to, you know, please trust in yourself and that there are definitely careers for you. So what am I going to discuss in the next 20 minutes? Uh, basically how and where to place your events ads to get people to come. Um, you know, so I won't harp on it too much. We know 2020 was a lot of things, uh, but basically, you know, hopefully we are kind of on the, you know, we're on the uptick. Um, so one of the things is that 2021 and 2022 events are gonna be everywhere. Um, there's gonna be a lot of competition. Um, so you really do need to be finding and distilling that wow factor for your event and selling it really hard. And for a lot of times, ads are the first thing people are going to see about your event. So they are important um, as well. But I think on the upside of that, there, there is going to be so much competition. There's going to be a lot of saturation in the market. But I think people are going to be extremely excited about everything and wanting to attend everything and wanting to hear about everything and, and just kind of moving into that next uh, that next part of, of, of uh, you know, the, this decade. Um, just a couple of things. These are just some New Orleans and Atlanta events that are already scheduled for 2021. Um, obviously Essence Fest, uh, Jazz and Heritage Festival, French Quarter Fest, um, and uh, a bunch of different things in Atlanta. We have professional sports uh, games coming back as well. And my personal favorite live music, um, I know that we all miss that um, as well, whether you're in Atlanta or New Orleans or anywhere else in the United States. So before we kind of get into everything, let's go back to basics. So the goals for any events, essentially. Number one, creating awareness. You need people to know about your event in order for them to come. If you can rely on purely word of mouth, then you are a very interesting business. Um, after that, we need to get RSVPs, we need to get interest. Obviously getting people to attend the event, uh, whether it be virtual or in person. Um, and then as well as engaging the, the people that do attend or the people that can attend as well. And then of course, you know, that follow-up and planning for future events is really important as well. And uh, there's a lot that happens uh, during the event that leads into that as well. So we're just going to start from the top. So building awareness. <clears throat> so how can you build awareness with your ads? Um, you know, the, obviously the point of any awareness campaign is to create interest. Um, and for me, a lot of times when I'm trying to build awareness about something, I usually start with display tactics. So it's a really highly targeted way to start setting the scene and for giving people information as to what they can expect from your event. Um, so what does display look like? Obviously, you know, a lot of people hear that. It's, it's kind of an umbrella term for anything that you sort of see, but maybe not without that high amount of intent. You're not actively seeking it out, but it's in your periphery, it's around you um, as well. So what does that look like? Obviously targeting on Google's display network. That's doing programmatic native advertising. Video advertising is also considered a part of a display tactic. 
um, over the top is, uh, you know, obviously advertising on uh, television um, outside of kind of that traditional media commercial um, sense. It's a lot of on the streaming channels as well, um, which is a big thing. There is, a, you know, I think half of the population is considered a, a cable cutter at this point, and that kind of trend seems to just be increasing. Um, and then connected TV is just anybody that watches sort of like YouTube or internet on a smart television. So you can reach people in that sense as well. So it really creates a kind of organic, uh, authentic feel as well. Um, some things that I see um, in other ads and some, some do's and don'ts to kind of help you. Um, I would say for an event specifically, feature actual people if you can. Um, uh, if you have anything from previous uh, times or um, you know, even if you have to use stock imagery, I think people uh, just really respond to that better than just you know, a load of copy and maybe some graphic. Um, drive the benefits of your event as much as you can. Um, you know, whether that's networking or, or fundraising or, um, or just, you know, experience, fun, food, whatever it is, and then explain how to get to the event. So how are they going to get that conversion? Are they going to sign up? Do they need to reserve? Do they need to buy tickets? What does that look like? Some don'ts. Don't fill your ad with a ton of copy. Uh, people don't really take the time to read it too much. Don't get kitschy with the COVID stuff. Um, this is just kind of one thing that I have noticed. I think a lot of, I think we're gonna be seeing a lot of that in the next year where people are just kind of going back to that. And I think if, I think making it humorous is fine, but it's also, this was a very difficult time, traumatic time for a lot of people. So it can come off really tone deaf where it's just like, if everyone's using it, find another angle to talk about your event. And don't just spray people with your event as well. Um, I see this a lot where people are just like throwing out ads to anyone and everyone. There's no targeting. It's just too much. And you're ultimately just kind of wasting your money um, because there's so much targeting options available with advertising, digital advertising, especially now. It's just, that's just really a waste of your, of your time and your money. So these are just a couple of example awareness ads. So you can see um, obviously Essence Fest as well. Um, you know, you can see the time and the date and what it is and information can be found here. Um, and it, you can see that it's a virtual event. So these are just like really strong awareness ads, getting people to see, setting the scene. It's obviously glamor or it's an open house, it's uh, for a school and things like that. So you can see that there. So on to the second part, obviously increasing RSVPs. Uh, RSVPs or ticket sales or whatever your conversion is, is really important to your vendors, your sponsors, the people that are um, you know, showing up to your event, the people that are working at your event. So it's really important to um, as you're moving down into the funnel after you've been, you know, working on your awareness as well to start focusing on increasing those RSVPs. So how can ads directly impact RSVPs? So the thing that I think most people don't understand about event advertising specifically is that ads need to be designed for whatever platform they are on. Your strategy cannot be the same for every network. Um, that's just going to come off as templated. And once again, that's not humanizing the event. That's not tailoring anything to the specific people that you want to come and however they are ingesting your advertising. So some ads that are actually really helpful for directly for impacting RSVPs are things like search ads. Um, again, there's a lot of high intent there if somebody is looking for Atlanta networking events, if somebody is looking for, you know, New Orleans date night ideas, um, that is a really great, great way to obviously target those people. Um, and as well as that, you're getting to this top of SERPs, which is search engine results pages. So as I said, this is going to be a really competitive year with events. Um, you know, everybody is a little restless. Um, so that organic aspect of it, of obviously, you know, any event pages or any like kind of specific industry pages, it's going to be hard to get your maybe specific website landing page to the top of those. Um, 
Um, influencer advertising is a great way to spread information about your event as well. You're putting a face to the event. You're allowing someone else to kind of put their own spin on it, reaching their audience and finding new audiences as well. I find that email ads are also a really great way for, um, for event advertising just because they're high probability converters. These are people that are checking their email, that they're obviously probably on some sort of uh, device right there. So it becomes really easy for them to increase their RSVP or to forward it, to send it, to save it, et cetera. And then of course, with any sort of advertising campaign, doing your remarketing or retargeting, whatever else you'd like to call it, um, is really, really important um, after you've been building awareness because if people have interacted with your ads, have they visited your site? You have, these are, it's just giving you more chance to give them new offers to and to highlight different parts of your event to basically sell them again. And so you're keeping them in a longer funnel, which is really important for ads or for events, excuse me. You can see um, just kind of an ad for the Hawks on the side there, the Atlanta Hawks. These are just kind of some examples of kind of like specific RSVP related ads. So you can see um, obviously things like the New Orleans Saints, they're trying to get people um, into the uh, field level suites and everything um, to buy those seats and everything. And that's for like a long season. So you're really getting um, a longer lifetime value of out of that customer. And then you can see the other one is for the medieval times tournament in Atlanta. Um, always an exciting time. And uh, what you can see is you're booking a ticket essentially. So that counts as an RSVP um, ultimately. So that's, these are just kind of two ads. You know, you're selling the benefits, you're talking about um, what's going to be there. You're using a code to give them like maybe an offering. So these are all like really strong ads. So increasing engagement once things are kind of maybe one, while you're advertising things and while things are going. Um, the one thing that I do notice a lot is that people don't seem to understand that not all advertising metrics are created equal. Um, it takes more digging to get to the really kind of important metrics. Um, you know, a lot of platforms don't necessarily put that in the default setting. Um, you know, nothing shady or anything, but that's kind of just my experience. Um, there's two things that I wanted to bring up. There's kind of something called what we call vanity metrics. And then there are things that are KPIs and vanity metrics are kind of things that a lot of people, you know, say, oh, you can see that this makes it, I'm being successful, but these kind of metrics, they're important in everything, but they're not telling as much of a story as some of these other ones can. Um, so things like click through rate, impressions, view rate, watch time, those are in my sense, kind of flat metrics, they don't really tell too much of a story as opposed to these KPIs, like your conversion rate is obviously, are people signing up? Are people RSVP? That's the most important thing. What's the conversion rate of what you're spending to what your conversion rate is? Things like earned video views. So if you're doing video advertising, if you have earned views, it means that someone has viewed your ad and then they went and sought out more of your content on your channel. And so that means that you are one, reaching the right audience and you're engaging them as well. And video played too. Um, this is an important metric. I mean, obviously I'm, you know, I'm very cognizant of a lot of people don't like getting video ads, uh, you know, right before their, their content and everything. But I think there is, um, this is something to be monitoring because you're seeing, are, are people dropping off of your video? Are they skipping it? Um, is it engaging? Um, is it, you know, are you reaching the right people? So managing the event attendance. So like I said earlier, ads are usually kind of the first stage of your event. They're the first thing people are probably seeing as well. So in my experience, there isn't too much that an advertising manager can do at an event, but there are some best practices that I've kind of um, noticed as well. So at the event, uh, particularly in this post COVID world, if we're even really calling that, calling it that, um, tell everyone to tip your gig and service industry employees. Um, it has been a rough, rough year for them. Um, and so highlighting that with your audiences is gonna be really important. Um, and it just makes the people that are working for you and working hard to make your event go well, they feel really appreciated um, and, and taken care of as well. 
Um, run through any tech issues, run through it 10 times if you need to in this kind of virtual world that we've ended up in. People, they lose their interest really quickly when the tech stuff starts happening. So be sure that that is, you know, have a backup plan in case anything goes wrong, have a hotspot ready, whatever you gotta do. And then let people know about any COVID related information. So if you are, you know, if people do need to wear a mask, if, um, you know, back, in, you know, I would say a little while ago, if you're taking temperatures, things like that just make people feel a little safe. And secondarily, they know what to expect. So they, they come prepared, they're not flustered or, or anything like that working into your event. Uh, most importantly, as an advertiser, I really um, insist on uh, photography and video of any event. So this helps with your engagement. This makes people want to come back to your social or your website and see, was my picture taken? Um, is it a good picture? <laughs> Hopefully. Um, and this helps with follow-up as well. So if you want, if you're planning to do another event, hopefully your event goes really well, you need content from your previous event. So having a really strong photography and video is just once again, kind of humanizing your event, making people understand what it's going to look like and what it looked like beforehand. And then also, if you're doing anything like recording or uh, obviously, you know, any video, you can kind of like fix any little hiccups in the post, um, the post editing as well. So don't stress too much about it if there are small hiccups. Um, that's the, the beauty of editing. And then just planning for the future. Um, you know, hopefully your event is not a one-time thing. If it is, that's great. Um, but hopefully you have kind of an opportunity to um, you know, learn from this event and improve upon it and things like that. And so planning for your future at the current event, you should be already planning for the next one. Um, so how to keep them coming. So some of the things to think about is keeping things like emails, names, shares, um, keep supporting people in the kind of your similar audience. I mean, like I said, there's gonna be tons of competition. Um, the more friends you make in, your, in that field, in, that, in event spaces, um, they're going to help support you. There, you know, I think anyone who has worked in, in the event space um, in the past, you know, whether you're a bartender or an event planner, or you, you know, run a venue or your manager of a venue, it's been a rough year. So just do your best to support other people so that they will hopefully support you, um, create a kind of um, mutually beneficial environment uh, for your events. Um, aggregate your user generated content. So that's the UGC. Um, so that means if people took pictures uh, or video at the event, if they had any sort of um, content surrounding that, um, just kind of aggregate that, have that there. That's gonna be great for doing any sort of follow-up or um, planning your next one. Or if somebody has like really good content, make sure that you invite them back to your next event. Um, try and get as much feedback as you can. Um, you know, get the temperature. Did people like the event? Did they like the food? Did they like the venue? Um, what did they like and what didn't they like? Um, that's gonna help you in your next part. And then try and see what kind of audiences attended your event and try and uh, pull some kind of personas out of them. Um, maybe you're noticing a different audience coming in and maybe that's gonna be um, something that you're gonna reach out to in your next event. And then finally, just remind people uh, if they came to your event, whether it's virtual or in person, um, remind them of the benefits that they, that they got from it, whether it's connection or just a good time or if they learned something, hopefully. Um, just remind them about that. Keep them excited about what is coming. So maybe some sort of teaser about something's happening in the next six months or something is happening, you know, we're already planning next year or things like that. And then if there was any hiccups, if there was a major problem, if there was something kind of noticeable, um, you know, be, feel free to talk about that the improvement is going to be made. Maybe you're going to be going to a bigger venue or, um, you know, maybe you're gonna be uh, kind of working with uh, different, uh, different entertainers or, 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 you know, whatever the case is. Um, I think it's great to point that out to people just so that if they did have some sort of negative experience that they trust that, you're, that you heard it, that you understood it and that you're working to improve it. And 
that's it for me, everyone. Uh, um, for the, uh, events. Thank you. And I hope to see all of you in real life at some point. Um, yeah, thank you so much. All right. Thanks so much, Morgan. That was great. I uh, have to say, I cannot wait for Jazz Fest also. So I expect to see a, a lot of ads um, when that comes up as well. All right, so this um, ends our presentation part of the webinar. So um, again, we're going to jump back and do some q and A. I I know that we're um, a little over our hour time, but I definitely want to get to all the questions. And, um, and again, this presentation will be posted online, so you're welcome to see it there. <clears throat> um, so let's get to the, to the questions. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A chat. Um, and I'll ask both uh, Jalisa and Morgan kind of one by one, but also feel free to jump in and riff off each other and uh, and put in your two cents. So really want to make sure we get the most out of this. Um, okay, so I've got a question. This looks like it's probably for Jalisa. Um, what are some good ways to stand, sorry, what are some good ways to stay on top of the news and media, especially the media that your customers are interested in um, that you have found helpful? So do you use an RSS feed or, or how do you stay on top of that? Wow, so for me, I definitely, I really assign to a lot of newsletters. <laughs> so I'm always, um, so like Deadline. Deadline sends me the most updated information on what's happening in Hollywood, what TV shows are being made, what's happening with those stars. Um, I definitely utilize social media. Um, of course, I have um, a, a season account as well. So you can track things within there. Um, so it's, it's multiple ways. So you just have to identify, um, even if you just find one media outlet. So if it is, I'm gonna just throw it out there. So if it's like a, a Ebony magazine, so you're, you're going to realize quickly, okay, what are the stories that they're talking about? And then you want to see, okay, well, if it's this particular celebrity people love, follow them. You know, they'll always post what interviews that they're doing. And so if we know that our audience loves Halle Berry, <laughs> then we want to stay on top of what Halle is doing. So it's, it's so many ways. It's so many ways, but in entertainment, I have to stay uh, updated on the different email blasts that they send me and just stay on top of um, what they're talking about. And so just staying in tune with social media is good as well. So it just depends. It depends. Yeah. Absolutely. And great example. Um, I really have to say that it, it seems like you just have to know what your audience likes and then kind of see where they're going there. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, Okay, so this is another one for you, I think, Jalisa, but again, Morgan, feel free to jump in. How do you adapt your brand's PR with the times? Obviously, this past year has been very difficult for a lot of folks. Um, so how has that PR adapted and what's changed? Yeah, so at the top of um, the pandemic, I had to definitely <laughs> pivot a lot. So I was so used to going to the new stations, of course, you know, like the WDSUs out here or the um, WWL TVs or wherever. Um, I have clients at TV One and all these places. So we're so used to going inside and being able to connect with that host or you know engage with their audience, whatever it may be. Um, so a lot of my clients had to shift to a lot of digital interviews. Um, so we utilized Zoom. We had to do all of that. So that was one big pivot that I had to make. Uh, with clients. And then we also had to pivot with, okay, the news is <laughs> talking about nothing but the pandemic. <laughs> so mm -hmm. how in the world do we make our clients uh, favorable in this moment, even though we're going through the hardest time, you know, that we've seen. So um, with a lot of my clients early on, I had to figure out, okay, I was working with a therapist um, at the top of the pandemic. So I had to figure out like, okay, well, all of these people are coming to her, <laughs> you know, they, they want help. At that time, um, of, of course, like the first responders and everyone is just so stressed out. Mm -hmm. So I had to utilize that key information. Of course, you can't go into too much <laughs> in detail, but the fact that she was a key person in the pandemic to support them, that was something great I can relate to the media. Um, and then with the, again, with the business bar, 
because they're opening up a restaurant in such uncertain times. That was a key thing that I could relate to the media and say, hey, look at these amazing women. This is what they're doing in uncertain times. Yeah. So those were, those were the things for me. Absolutely. Kind of using the trends and what's going on to help break through. Um, right. Right. All right. Well, all right. This one is for Morgan. Um, is it possible to see an ad too many times? Uh, and if so, how do you prevent that from happening in your campaign? So oversaturation. You can absolutely uh, have people see an ad too many times. Uh, basically, all you need to do to avoid that is just put a frequency cap on your ad. It's a pretty easy setting in most platforms, most advertising platforms. Um, you can do things like how many times a day they see them or just how often a un like a unique user sees your ad. So obviously, you know, you don't want just one person to see your ad one time. Um, so it becomes a little, um, <clears throat> it becomes a, a little, you have to do a little bit of math and kind of thinking about your own personal experiences and how you feel when you see an ad too many times about a certain brand um, and just kind of timing that out uh, to your audiences. Yeah, definitely don't want to be bombarded with the same thing over and over again. Um, all right, uh, one more for uh, Jalisa. How can you connect with current events to share a client's story? So you sort of touched on this a little bit um, regarding the business bar and things like that, but how do you, you know, use current events to your favor when you're breaking through with a client? So it, it kind of goes back to, to what I said initially. Um, you want to you utilize, you know, what's happening and really sh shaping that story. So if something is happening like a, a pandemic or, you know, did your client create masks within that time? Did they donate something? So you want to make sure, okay, what is this key thing that my client can do to stand out? So how can he or she, how can they be helpful in this crazy time or whatever is going on. So it may be something like, you know, even not even just a current, um, you know, the pandemic that we're in, but let's just think about the Essence Festival. So how can my client be a part of an amazing event that's going on right now in the city? So how can we shape their story to make sure that they're on that panel? How can we um, even create our own event within that weekend? to make sure that they are capturing some of these amazing amounts of people that are here in the city. So it's literally, no matter what's going on, whether it's an event, no matter if it's um, a pandemic happening, you have to make sure that you're shaping and positioning yourself to win. So just staying on top of what's happening is, is always key. And then just being able to redefine and being able to pivot in those times is, is super important. Absolutely. And, and really looking at the media as an ally and somebody or a group of people that, that you want to help because they will help you. So, right. um, absolutely. All right. Um, this is our last question. Um, it's for Morgan. Uh, how far in advance should you start promoting an event? Uh, does it differ with the type of event? I would say, yeah, it definitely differs with the type of event of the type of people that you need to be there. Um, obviously, I don't think you should be doing anything kind of too far ahead, at least with your advertising. I would say PR might have a little bit of a different timeline um, just because you don't want people to see an ad and then too much time passes and they kind of forget about it. Um, so I would just say at least you know, six to three months, I would probably start depending on the, the size of the event. If it's a, you know, Essence Festival, it would probably be a little sooner than that, um, mm -hmm. just because it's a massive uh, cultural and arts festival. Um, but if you're doing something more like a virtual event or um, something a little smaller, I think you could do things uh, just a couple of months ahead, at least starting your advertising. Definitely. Um, all right. Well, that is it with our Q&A uh, uh, session. So if you don't have any more questions, we'll wrap it up here. Um, I want to give another special thanks to our speakers, Jaleesa McDowell and Morgan Bashman. Again, Jaleesa McDowell is the founder and owner of McDowell's Branding Group. And I'll let her tell you a little bit more about her organization. So Jaleesa, if you want to 
sign off here? Yeah, um, so definitely my clients come to me to be their publicist. Um, so if you guys definitely need a publicist um, to help bring more media awareness to your brand, more um, visibility um, in, the, in the media space, or even to, to build up your, your media um, kits, whatever it is, um, that's what we help our clients do. And uh, most importantly, you know, we want to make sure that we're able to share their personal story. So I do a lot of personal branding with clients and really helping them really dive deep into what that looks like and how we can shape that narrative and control and, and build that buzz for their, um, for their brands. So I appreciate you guys again. Thank you so much. Oh, of course. And do you mind just telling folks where they can follow you and find you online? Oh, yeah. Um, so my business page is McDowell's Branding Group. Um, and that's on all social media platforms. And then my personal page is, of course, Jaleesa McDowell, and that's on all um, social media platforms. Perfect. And we will have that information available for folks as well. So thank you again. And go follow her online, everyone. <laughs> Morgan Bashman is the Director of Digital Advertising and Online Optimism, a full service digital marketing agency with offices in New Orleans and Atlanta. So you can find our organization at onlineoptimism.com or on Twitter at onlineoptimism. So I wanna thank everyone again. Don't forget to sign up for our next webinar uh, as we continue on with this six part series. We have three more presentations to go. Uh, and again, we'll be posting a link on uh, our website and on our social media platforms for everyone to see. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out at info at onlineoptimism.com. But otherwise, I wanna give an, a final thank you to our speakers and we really appreciate your insight and your expertise. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.